here's this nutrient that everyone you've ever met gets more than they need, yet it's marketed that you just need even more of it. And it doesn't even make that much of a difference in, in, in anything when you get more of it. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fit Vegan Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, Robert Cheek. I am super excited and fangirling a little bit. I met Robert many years ago, so I feel very blessed to have him on the podcast today. Um, Robert, how are you doing, man? Great, Lucky. Thanks so much for having me on. Excited to talk with you today. Yes, I'm excited to dive into your new book. Uh, but before I want to do a little introduction, for, in case some people don't know you, maybe they're new to veganism, um, they have to know about you. So I have your little your your story here that you grew up in a farm in Corvallis, Oregon. Oregon's absolutely beautiful. Um, you adopted vegan lifestyle in 1995 at the age of 15, weighing just 120 pounds. Uh, and today he's the author of the books "Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness," "Shredded Plant-Based Muscle," and the new release "The Plant-Based Athlete." Um, he's often referred to as the godfather of vegan bodybuilding, growing the industry from infancy in 2002 to where it is today. As a two-time natural bodybuilding champion, Robert is considered one of the Veg News Magazine's most influential vegan athletes. He tours around the world sharing his story of transformation from a skinny farm kid to a champion vegan bodybuilder. Um, Robert is the founder and president of Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness and maintains a popular website, veganbodybuilding.com. He is a regular contributor to the No Meat Athlete, Forks Over Knife, and Vegan Strong, is a multi-sport athlete, entrepreneur, and has followed a plant-based diet for more than 25 years, way before it was cool. Um, and you live in Colorado with your wife, and you two rescue chihuahuas. I love chihuahuas. That's awesome. Yeah. Colorado is beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks you. Thank you for that intro. And um, you're right. It was before it was cool. In fact, it was not cool <laughs> to yeah. be vegan back in the 90s. It was uncool. Um, but that's that's when I started back in 1995. And, uh, you know, I'm, gl I'm glad that it's more popular now. I'm glad that it's taken off. I'm glad that it's being embraced by so many people like that. That makes me happy because that's, you know, what I what I hoped this this movement would be able to do. And and here we are. Yeah. And honestly, it's been it's been amazing to see the movement grow. But I like I've said I know a lot about you. I've, I've done my research. I've listened to countless hours of of podcasts and interviews, but I'm always curious. Um, and for the people listening as well, like what got you to go vegan in 1995 at 15 years old, when you were trying to bulk, because I have a similar story to you. Um, like when you think bulking, you don't think vegan. So I'm curious kind of what happened at that age that made you like, I want to go vegan and I'm going to bulk. Yeah. Thanks, Lucky. I grew up on a farm and that was the big catalyst for me. I was around farm animals. I raised farm animals. I raised dairy calves and chickens and rabbits and plenty of other animals on our farm, horses and goats and ponies and turkeys and geese and ducks and all that. But I particularly raised myself uh, along with my brothers uh, and my parents, of course. But in the 4-H program, I raised dairy calves that I would show at the county fair and then sell at the auction. Yeah. Uh, to unfortunately be turned into someone's meal and same with chickens. And I think even with rabbits, perhaps um, selling them at the auction. And you know, it was my older sister, Tanya, who organized this animal rights week at my high school. And I thought, you know what? Um, you know, she was vegan. I didn't really even know what that was. And this was back in 1995, you know, before the internet, or at least before most people had the internet. And I thought, you know what? I'll go be vegan for a week just to support my older sister, you know? And so I attended this event at my high school. It would it was basically taking place during like lunch periods and, and things like that. But there were videos of factory farming and animal testing, and uh, and 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 literature about about those things, primarily factory farming, and speakers giving presentations about animal rights, and you know, just having conversations with people. I decided, you know what, uh, this makes a lot of sense to me. I don't want to cause harm to to animals, uh, particularly growing up on a farm and having cows and, and, and chickens and other animals that have first names and they're, they're treated like pets until they're sold at the auction. And so it made sense to me. And so I decided I would become vegan and, uh, and see if I would stick with it. And of course, I was a five sport athlete. I barely weighed 120 pounds. I, I was only 89 pounds at the start of eighth grade, two years prior. So I was always a small kid, but I, I was really into soccer and basketball and wrestling and running uh, track and field and long distance running and other track and field sports and, and played tennis. And, uh, you know, I was just really, really active. 
And even at, at my high school, I was playing, you know, five different sports, you know, three seasons, but then I would do some in the summer and recreationally. And, and sometimes I would, if I didn't make the basketball team, I wrestled instead and that kind of thing. I got tired of soccer. I ran cross country. Uh, so I, but I always wanted to get bigger and stronger. And I wondered if I could, I, I wasn't sure that I could, cause I knew milk does a body good and, and, and people in the commercials got bigger and stronger. And I, I heard that beef is yeah. what's for dinner. And I heard that, uh, that animal protein was good for putting on muscle size and everything. And so I wasn't, I wasn't totally sure, but my sister gave me confidence and said, you know, Robert, you know, it, it's not that you need meat, milk, and eggs. Um, but you need the, the nutrition that's commonly associated with those things. You know, you need the protein, you need the calcium, you need the amino acids, you need the nutrition that we, we often think of with, with those kind of foods. And as it turns out, you can get them from uh, some better sources from plants. And so that's what I did. And I eventually, I, uh, I finished up high school as a, as a pretty good athlete and I ran cross country in college. So a long distance runner, you know, long distance mm -hmm. sport. And then I discovered weightlifting and I just, uh, at that point I weighed about 150 pounds and I've been vegan for almost five years at that point. And I just started lifting and I started training and I had this vision of getting bigger and stronger. And it was a struggle at first early on. And I've written about that in previous books and how I wasn't really eating a calorie surplus in order to, to elicit that muscle yeah. building, that, that growth. But once I figured that out, you know, I put on 19 pounds in 12 weeks and 28 pounds in 10 months, another 10 pounds after that became a competitive bodybuilder. And then I think my, my second competition I ever did, I became a champion bodybuilder. And then I uh, finished runner up a bunch of times and became a champion bodybuilder again. And, um, and eventually put on, uh, put on a hundred pounds and I peaked at it at 220 pounds about two months ago before my new book came out. And I've subsequently lost about 13 pounds. I joke that who knew my, who knew the plant-based athlete, my new book was so good with weight loss because the stress I've been losing weight like crazy. Um, so, uh, of releasing such a, such a popular book, but yeah. But yeah, that's, that's, that's the story. Lucky, uh, you know, from a farm kid who eventually put on a hundred pounds and became a champion vegan bodybuilder. And, and here we are weighing about 207 pounds as I'm talking to you today. Yeah, that's impressive. And, and I just have to say, um, you had a pretty wise older sister to, to just realize like, you just need the amino acids and the same nutrition. I would have never thought of that, like back then at that age. So yeah, you just shout out to your sister. That's a, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty and, impressive. And she's still vegan. She's got a vegan family, vegan daughter. She has her PhD in so, uh, microbiology and soil microbiology specialist. And she's a university professor. And, you know, she's been doing this for, I've been vegan for 25 years. So she's been vegan for who knows, 27, 28 years. And, and she's the one I give all the credit to, you know, without her uh, leadership and being a positive role model, and introducing me to the vegan lifestyle, you know, who knows if or when I would have stumbled upon it. But uh, so grateful that that she did play that role in my life because it's impacted every aspect of my life. What I do as a career, where I've traveled to, who my friends are, uh, how I've been able to, uh, you know, contribute uh, to, you know, the world around me, that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, yeah, I give a lot of credit to my sister. It's amazing. And what? Um because if we look back in 1995, like we, we said, like before veganism was cool, what, what kind of resources did you have access to? Or did you utilize to kind of help guide you and how you were fueling all the sports and then jumping into bodybuilding? Yeah, not a lot of resources back then. Um, you know, I started in late 95. So December, 1995, I think by 96, I was, I was probably using the internet and, and looking up some things online, not finding a whole lot of stuff, of course. Um, it was very new, the internet was a brand new thing. Uh, John Robbins had Diet for New America um, and that book, Diet for New America, you know, it went on to be a, ma a major bestseller. And uh, he's actually one of the guys that endorsed my new book. In fact, I just signed a book for him recently. And he's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, he's on the, the Mount Rushmore of vegan legends. Uh, he really put veganism on the map with his book, that I think came out in the 1980s, the 80s or 90s, but probably the 80s. And there was also a book by Harvey Diamond called Fit for Life. Um, and it just happened to be a plant-based you know, fitness book. It was about uh, eating fruit and vegetables and, and, and working out and having this you know, healthy plant-based lifestyle. So uh, Fit for Life was good and Diet for New America was good. Uh, Howard Lyman was out there doing his thing, the mad cowboy. He was a, a big, you know, big name back then. And, uh, and vegan outreach was doing these like black and white 
uh, booklets back then. I think they were they weren't even in color. They were black and white um, in, in the 90s. And it was it was like, why vegan? And it was, you know, philosophical and, and moral and ethical arguments for veganism. And I found those to be effective. But really, for me, it wasn't until I discovered the Body for Life program, Bill Phillips Body for Life program, which is nothing to do with veganism, but it was a fitness training program that kept me consistent in my, my, um, my meals, my nutrition, and my training. I just did a vegan version of whatever they were calling for, what they called for you know, chicken breast, I would eat tofu, and, and they, they called for uh, a whey protein drink, I would have a soy protein drink. Again, this is the late 90s, early 2000s. And so I made a vegan version of the Body for Life program. And I give a lot of credit to that. I mention it even in my new book uh, and in probably almost all my other books that the Body for Life program gave me a sense of structure, gave me some discipline and structure and said, okay, Robert, you're going to train six times per week or six days per week, and Mm -hmm. you're going to eat six meals per day. And you're going to, you know, do these types of of exercises and eat these types of meals that, that are, you know, things like broccoli and brown rice and potatoes and beans and things that that omnivores eat as well, who are, who are building muscle and, and uh, pursuing fitness goals. And, uh, and that gave me that structure. And so I give a lot of credit to that. So those were the resources I had back then. And then, you know, and then later the internet became a little more popular and uh, uh, the MySpace days of 2003, uh, yeah. 2004, and I started to build some community there with other people uh, who were doing this lifestyle. And, uh, and that sense of community was really helpful too, to have friends, other vegan athletes from around the world to, you know, connect with and interact with. Yeah. And, that, and that's what I find incredible about your story and kind of what you've built up to this point is now you have kind of built your own set of resources that I feel would have been useful to you when you first transitioned and wanted to do vegan bodybuilding. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because uh, I had to, I don't want to, you know, say it like I had to carve my own path or pave my own way, but I kind of did. Like the, yeah. the resources weren't there. And so I had to figure that out along the way. And so when I wrote books like Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness, I released more than 10 years ago, like that was my my blueprint, you know, that like was my 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 system. And then I, I just learned more over the years. You know, I, I, I started working with Forks Over Knives and I took Dr. Campbell's plant-based nutrition course through Cornell University at the Center for Nutrition Studies. And I got all those guys like Dr. Esselstyn and Campbell and Gregor to endorse my books. And I just learned a lot more. And then I released Shredded and Plant-Based Muscle. And it was all kind of leading up to, uh, to this book, The Plant-Based Athlete, which covers such a range of Everything. athletes. Yeah, of athletes out there and you know, tons of anecdotal stories from athletes uh, who've been doing this for decades, some since birth. Uh, and their meal plans, their day in the life routine, their recipes, all that kind of stuff, plus the evidence-based science that we just didn't have 10 years ago. We didn't have five years ago. In fact, as you know, these studies are coming out like every month now. They're just coming out all the time where it's like, you know, the game changers came out and did its thing and it was amazing. But then all the studies came out, you know, after that. And then we we submitted our book proposal and then our, and then the actual book, the manuscript, and it was ready for print. And, and it went to print and even more studies come out that didn't even make it into the book. You know, so we're in this era now where there's, there's a lot more evidence-based nutrition and we have a lot of that in, this, in the book as well. And so uh, I basically l- used all those lessons that I learned along the way to pour into all these different books and especially this most recent book because it's really the culmination of, of everything that I've done while also taking the lessons learned from Rich Roll and Rip Asselstyn and Brendan Brazier and Sonia Looney and Fiona Oaks and Christine Bartaros and Scott Jurek and, and James Wilkes and Dotsie Bausch and all these great athletes and putting it all under one umbrella where it's like, this is the how-to book, the how to be a plant-based athlete. This is your resource. It's like 100,000 words, 350 pages. Um, it's, it's a dense manual that shows you exactly what to do for macro and micronutrition, for meal planning, for um, you know, uh, creating uh, foods that you're you're going to stick with and that you'll be consistent with, they can help you with results, uh, helping with recovery, reducing inflammation, eating high high anti-inflammatory foods, high antioxidant-rich foods, uh, focusing on uh, nutrients per calorie and nutrient density, and being aware of calorie density and how to you know navigate that whole world. So I, I you know, obviously it's done well. It, it, as you know, I mean it. It made the New York Times bestseller list. It, came, it became a number one international bestseller because it finished number one in Canada, it became a publisher's weekly bestseller. And we just landed international deals in Italy and Taiwan and Germany 
And so it's, you know, it's resonating with people. And that's, that's really why we wrote it. And, and uh, we're, we're pleased to see that it's having that impact. Yeah. And all of that happened. And when the, the book came out, like what, two months ago, two, three months ago? No, no, uh, June, June 15th. It came out three weeks ago. Uh, three weeks ago. Three weeks. Yeah. And all this already happened. Like, yeah. I, when I was talking to someone about the book, I was like, it's basically um, the, the Bible of vegan fitness is how you want to look at it because everything's in there. I, I've, I've read a lot of other books about, about veganism, about fitness, but no one approached it the way that you guys did. I've never had um, read some of the books that talked about like, Hey, you need to watch, you need to look at your calories. You need to look at your protein. You need to look at your macros because the majority of the time it was more like eat whole food plant-based. Well, in order to achieve, like, cause I'm in this space as a fitness coach as well, like right, right. in order to achieve, uh, you want to build lean muscle, you want to shift in body composition. You, you need to look at these metrics, right? They, right. they matter. And right. what you fill them with makes a tremendous difference. So I was really happy to hear that you guys kind of put that together, but I'm curious, how did that conversation with Matt, who's your, your co-author, I wrote the book with you, how did kind of that come about? And you guys like, let's just build the ultimate book for plant-based athletes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's actually, it's a, it's kind of a long story, but I can give you the, the short version. Um, the short version is I wrote this proposal in 2013, eight years ago, titled The Plant-Based Athlete, the same concept, the whole thing. I had an agent in, um, in Beverly Hills, California that, that my friend Brian Wendell from Forks Over Knives put me in touch with. Mm -hmm. uh, met with him like on the 25th floor of his office. And I thought, oh, this is all exciting. You know, this is a big deal. And I'm, I've already self-published uh, a book and and now I'm going to go with a major publisher and all this stuff. And, um, and you know, that, that agent uh, didn't end up working out actually. Um, he, he loved the, the conversation in person when I was, you know, pitching the book idea, but when I wrote the actual proposal, which you have to submit about a 50 or 60 page proposal for a publisher to, um, to consider. And a, so an agent gets that proposal and they, they pitch it out to uh, publishers. Um, he didn't like the proposal at all. Um, it, it was too dry. It was, too boring for him. He just, you know, it wasn't working for him. So I went out on my own and I almost, I almost got a book deal with uh, a publisher called The Experiment, uh, Matthew Lore. We were in touch. I mean, it was like, you know, direct contact, me with the president of the publishing company. And it was the same guy who published the first Forks Over Knives book. So he was familiar with, you know, the plant-based world and my work and all that. And it just didn't work out. And so what this agent said, in Beverly Hills, he said, listen, man, the, the book concept is a great idea, but you're not the guy to write it. You know, he didn't like my proposal. So he said, you got to raise a bunch of money and hire a professional writer to help you with the proposal and to write the book and all this. So I started writing a book that was going to be an ebook to, to sell as a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And I got carried away and it turned out to be a 400 page book that I narrowed down to about 320 or 330 pages. And that was my book Shredded. And I went ahead and self-published it, and it turned out to be my most popular book that I that I ever wrote, uh, until this new one, of course. And and that gave me a platform to travel around the world. And this book, Shred It, was in, endorsed by Campbell and Esselstyn, and 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 even um, Phil Collins from Def Leppard and Emily Deschanel, and you know all these all these big name people. And I did it all myself. It's all self-published and everything. And it took me, I mean, a week after the book came out, I was on tour in Australia, you know, and I was doing my thing. And I toured in China and, and in Europe and Caribbean around, around. And, and so the book never, the plant-based athlete never got, never got, got made. And I, I went on to, uh, to work with Vanessa Espinoza and co-author uh, plant-based muscle. And then I wrote another, an ebook, uh, uh, to, still a 232 page book about how to build a successful vegan brand. Cause I got really into that for a period of time and wrote that ebook. And then this work comes full circle. I was on tour in Arizona. Of course, I lived in Arizona at the time, but I was on tour in Tucson, two hours from home. I got a call from Brian Wendell from Forks Over Knives. He was in town. He asked if I wanted to meet for dinner. I was 90 minutes away and I drove there to meet him. And, uh, and he said, hey, um, do you want to do this publishing thing again? I got another agent I can put you in touch with. So I said, yeah, I think I'm ready now. I've self-published like four books. I think I'm ready for the, the big stage. I'm ready for mm -hmm. it. So uh, he put me in touch with his, uh, with his agent. I pitched her the same idea, the plant-based athlete telling the compelling stories, of the world's greatest plant-based athletes. And of course, now this is 2018, there were way more athletes to choose from than 2013, way more big yeah. name and professional and all that. And so I, I pitched this to her and same old story, Lucky. 
same old story. She said, you're not, you know, you're not the guy to do this, or at least not by yourself. I'm like, man, you kidding me? I've been doing this for two decades and I've, I've you know, sold 60,000 self-published books. Hardly anybody does that. What's going on here? She said, you need a co-author. And I said, man, who could be, who would be the perfect co-author? I'm thinking, you know, Brendan Brazier and Rich Rule and who would work with me and who wouldn't and realize that, you know, some of these guys wouldn't just wouldn't work with me on this. But the, the one guy that would be the perfect co-author was Matt Frazier from No Meat Athlete. We had been friends for more than 10 years, or I guess at that point, eight years, maybe uh, now more than 10 years. Uh, he runs the big No Meat Athlete community, nomeatathlete.com with endurance athletes. Huge, I run, yeah. Yeah. Probably the biggest uh, plant-based athlete community in the world. I run the oldest and, you know, one of the oldest and biggest uh, vegan strength communities in the world with veganbodybuilding.com. Uh, we've been on tour together for years, meet up on the vegan cruise and give presentations together. And, uh, and we've worked together. He's endorsed all my previous books. I've endorsed all his books. So I knew that he was going to be at this vegan event in Florida. And I lived in Arizona at the time. I flew across the country, met up with him and said, uh, you know, here's my idea for the plant-based athlete. I've already got the agent from Forks Over Knives. You know, they, they only produce major books, big time books. Uh, what do you think? And uh, we took a walk on the boardwalk on the beach and he said, I'm in. And, and then from there, we got the deal done with the agent and we went to work and we, over the next two years, produced what is now, you know, uh, one of the, the best selling books uh, in America and actually one of the best selling books in the world, The Plant-Based Athlete. So I told you that was the short version uh, and it'd be a little bit longer, but that's. That was, that was awesome. But, but it's, but it's a, you know, it's also a story of, of persistence too. You know, I mean, I left out all the other stuff about driving around the country, sleeping in my car, selling books out of my car, getting rejected by all the publishers, speaking to tiny audiences of literally five people when I'm on tour at universities. I left out a lot of stuff, but that's how it came to be with me and Matt, uh, knowing each other for a long time and realizing we've got the endurance and strength combination, big communities, let's come together. He's told his story. I've told my story. Let's tell all these stories now. And, uh, and we set out to, to make this the, the unequivocal leader in the plant-based fitness world. And I think we've done that. Yeah, that's an incredible story. And it just shows like the, like the hustle and the grind that went behind making it happen. And that's why I think it's also a really powerful book because it's a combination of the two worlds that people will usually go for. It's like, hey, I just want to get big and strong or like I want to have endurance and like run like ritual or like Scott Jurek and then I want to do triathlon. So I think that's always a great combination to have um, you two guys write the book. One of um, one of the questions I have for you and every vegan gets it, you probably got in every podcast is the whole protein question, which I know you've answered in the book, which I, I was surprised to hear the numbers. They're higher than yeah. like what I've heard before. Cause I think you, you guys mentioned for athletes between 1.2 and two grams per kg of body weight. Right. I think that was yeah. a, the range. Yeah. Um, so w- one question I have for you is when you first transition, what like was soy, did soy had the, the stereotype that it still has today? When you first transition, because you you mentioned like you replaced it with tofu and then soy protein powder, so yeah, right yeah. there, like the whole world would be shocked if <laughs> if someone was yeah. to do that. Yeah, yeah, I I was eating a lot of soy protein back then. I mean, I was I was even trying to get sponsored by Eve's Veggie Cuisine, you know, that makes the t- yeah. tofu. I mean, I, I literally I saved all my packages as a teenager. It was like my closet was like filled with hundreds of these packages that I saved and took photos of and tried to get sponsored. I wanted to be like the, you know, the vegan athlete representing the, the tofu company kind of thing. And I wrote proposals and all that. I mean, I always had this kind of hustle, you know, that's just the way it is with me. I've always been doing that kind of stuff and it didn't work out of course, but, um, but it was, but it was fun. And, and I, yeah, I ate a, a massive amount of soy protein back then and, and protein in general. I mean, I was eating, I don't even know how many grams per uh, kilogram of body weight, but I was eating like for a period of time, like 300 grams of protein a day, like ridiculous Damn. amounts because I was following the muscle magazines, right? I was following yeah. like what big steroid bodybuilders who were 300 pounds were doing, even though I only weighed 150 because I wanted to be eventually like that. You know, at least I wanted yeah. to be 220 someday, 225, whatever. Um, yeah, and more so hands, more muscle mass. That's why they're yeah. eating so much. Yeah. So I was, I was, you know, pounding 
uh, protein like crazy, eating 5,000 calories a day, all this stuff. And I was, you know, I was often full and bloated and gassy and, um, and just cramming food. And I remember I would lie there in bed. I was in Salt Lake City at the time going to school and I was really enthusiastic about lifting. And I, I mean, I even went to the same gym as Carl Malone, who's one of the great NBA basketball yeah. players in history. And I'd see him at the gym and, and I was studying anatomy, physiology and, and working even in a cadaver lab. And I was getting really into it and, and uh, about, about building muscle and, 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 and studying sports nutrition as well. And learning all about, you know, uh, ATP and the Krebs cycle and all this stuff back then. And I was just so into it. And, um, and I was, I was just eating like crazy because of what the, uh, the muscle magazines kind of were, were telling me to do. And then that's when I, I stumbled upon the, the body for life program and got a little bit more, more structure. But I, what I was going to say is I would be lying in bed in Salt Lake city, like, like eating my seventh cliff bar of the day. Cause that was like the only bar to eat back then. Yeah. Because I, I wanted to reach my 5,000 calories. I'd be like, you know, gnawing on this cliff bar as I was going to bed uh, and, while studying, you know, anatomy, physiology, and sports nutrition, because like those were the goals that I was trying to reach. And of course, and I don't do that these days. I don't eat anywhere near 5,000 calories a day. I eat probably less than 100 grams of protein per day, most days. And it's just not something that I think about or worry about um, anymore. And, and that's partly just having done it for 25 years. I'm just... I'm just not all that infatuated with protein these days. Yeah, it's not not as much of a worry as it used to be. No, not um, at all. Not at which all. Which I know you cover a lot of this information in the book, and I want people to go and grab the book. But I'm also curious, like, if we if we talk about body transformation, building muscle, fat loss, a lot of the focus tends to be on like, like, give me the perfect macronutrient split. I want the exact percentage that's going to be magical and change my whole body. <laughs> I'm sure you hear that one often. Um, how important is the protein compared to the carbohydrates and, and the fat compared to the overall calorie? Well, I think they're all important, but I think protein is just overhyped and gets so much extra f emphasis and focus on it. And I, and I don't think that's really all that helpful, actually. I mean, we only have certain uh, small protein requirements, maybe 10% of our total calories coming from protein. It's not that significant, uh, even, even for athletes. I think what's much more important is your total calorie intake and the source of those calories coming from hopefully you know, mostly whole plant foods in, in relation to what your expenditure is. I mean, that's if you're trying to put on muscle or you know, change, your, change your body or something like that, your, your calorie intake versus expenditure is really, really important, but also that the source of those calories, like where are these calories coming from? You know, if they're eat, if they're just from processed tofu and and uh, Cliff bars and protein drinks, like you know my days in, in the early early two thousands, uh, may not be so great, may not be super healthy either. But if we can get a whole variety of of uh, antioxidant rich, vitamin mineral rich, phytonutrient rich, leafy greens, fruits, legumes, grains, nuts, seeds, all that, um, that's fantastic. So I think I, I try to tell that story in the book that, you know, protein has been overrated, overmarketed, overhyped for a very, very long time. And it has roots uh, coming from post-World Wars. It has roots in the rise of television and microwaves and TV dinners and fast food restaurants and family diners and masculinity uh, during a certain era of, of uh, this association with the men and, and, and hunting and providing meat for the family and all this kind of stuff. So there's these, these marketing roots um, they go back to television, radio, and all of that, but then they also go into the sports nutrition industry, the sports supplement industry, um, which you know you get whey and casein as the the byproduct of cheese making, and and then you can powder that up and sell that and and put it in the muscle magazines and and make a really good living. Uh, in fact, over a hundred billion dollar sports nutrition industry these days. Good profit margin. I used to work the, in the supplement space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's also lucky. I mean, I've said this a few times recently in some recent interviews. I mean, there's there's basically uh, almost nobody you, you've ever met. I mean, anyone you walk down the street and see or, or at, the, at the supermarket, at a sports arena, anyone that you ever come across, there's hardly anyone you've ever met with a true protein deficiency. Uh, unless there's a, an eating disorder or there's um, a starvation situation or a food desert or, or lack of access to calories, maybe in a developing country or in a food desert within a, within a developed country. 
uh, some sort of addiction, um, uh, houselessness or homelessness or, or, or um, not having secure funds to acquire food. But aside from that, uh, most people we've, we've ever met in our entire life uh, get way more protein than they need. Uh, it, we've hardly ever met anyone with a true medical protein deficiency, yet we're convinced, even though we eat more protein than we need per capita, that we need more of it, and we need more of it, and we need more of it, and that more is better. And so it's a really fascinating thing that here's this, here's this nutrient that everyone you've ever met gets more than they need, yet it's marketed that you just need even more of it. And it doesn't even make that much of a difference in, in, in anything when you get more of it. It's not like you're all of a sudden just, you know, much bigger and, and more muscular or anything like that. It's, most of it get, gets eliminated. Um, when it, if it's not used, it may get stored. It, it brings in extra calories. It often brings in uh, dietary cholesterol in the form of animal protein and saturated fat and uh, artery clogging material that can create plaque in, in arteries and damage endothelial cells. Uh, it could be a class one or class two A carcinogen in the in the case of of certain uh, processed meats or red meats. Uh, there's a lot of baggage that comes with it, and yeah. so we have this idea of of optimizing protein, but I don't think we take the time to optimize things like like antioxidant intake, complex carbohydrate intake, water intake, sleep, uh, managing stress. Um, fat intake, um, DHA, EPA, all we do is focus on protein. And we think that's just like, once you once you reach protein, then you're just going to get as fit and as strong and as muscular as you want. Um, and I, and I, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's, it's definitely overhyped. And, uh, and we try to talk in, in detail about that in the book, about the roots of that and why you're doing things like buying protein bars that are not protein bars at all. They're carbohydrate bars or fat bars wrapped in protein bars clothing. And anyone who knows the calories per gram of macronutrients can figure that out. If something has 12 grams of protein, if a bar has 12 grams of protein, but 25 grams of carbs, you know already because the same four calories per gram of, yeah. uh, of carbohydrate and protein, you're eating a carbohydrate bar. You're not eating a protein bar. It's a car just like if you have people saying they're eating, you know, beans for protein. Well, it's a carbohydrate food. It's got a decent amount of protein, but it's, a, it's primarily co a, a complex carbohydrate food, not a protein food. So, so once you can kind of realize those, those things about protein and, and that, uh, you know, you don't need as much as you think, then, um, you know, you can, you can, you can figure out what your intake should be by determining what your calorie expenditure is and what your intake is and, and kind of a, a healthy percentage of what you want to consume, 10%, 15% of your calories and protein, you know, whatever works for you, but without, you know, without overthinking it or overemphasizing it um, or overdoing it. Um, and I think uh, increasing the complex carbohydrate intake is gonna benefit a lot of people with overall nutrition as well. Yeah, because it's also protein sparing as well. Yeah, and, and you're also gonna get I mean, you're going to get higher amounts of fiber and vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. I mean, we're, what are we doing drinking protein shakes and, and, you know, chewing on just blocks of tofu? We, we, could, we could be eating uh, blackberries and raspberries and blueberries and mango and, and kale and collards and spinach and, and uh, you know, and, and quinoa and all these things. Like there's just so much more nutrition there that still has the fiber. It still has the water. It still has the uh, micronutrients, vitamins and minerals still has the, the super high antioxidants or the omega-3 essential fats. Like, and you know, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. Cause all the nutrient dense foods tend to be higher in carbohydrates. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I've said, whether it's here on the rich roll podcast or other interviews that when we focus on and obsess about protein, we do ourselves a disservice because we're not giving enough attention to complex carbohydrates. That should be the foundation of your meal. That, that's, that's what you're doing when you're eating, when you're eating oatmeal or when you're eating, um, you know, potatoes or when you're eating rice and beans and lentils. And these are carb carbohydrate foods. These are the foundation of your meals. These are where the calories come from. This is your post, your pre and post workout nutrition. Like this is what we need to focus on um, without like this, you know, thinking like, like my co-author says, Matt Frazier talks about, you know, we don't have to have this idea of meat is in the middle of the plate. And then, mm. you know, a potato and then like a, you know, broccoli or, or something on the side. Uh, we, we don't just have to replace that with a block of tofu in the middle and, you know, the potato and broccoli on the side. Like we can, we can balance out these meals 
and, and, and carbohydrates can absolutely be the star of the show. And that's what we, I think that's the wording we use in the book. They, they should be the, the, the star of the show or the highlight of the plate. And, and whether that's potatoes or yams or sweet potatoes or oats or beans or rice or lentils or whatever it is, eggplant or mushrooms, whatever, like carbohydrates should take up the most room on the plate and, and not just for athletic performance, but for health as well. And it's, it's, that's one of the great things is that eating, eating for performance on a plant-based diet is just, is, is good for overall health as well, because your, your antioxidant intake is, is increased. Your anti-inflammatory uh, food intake is increased. Your, your water intake is likely increased. You know, you're more conscious of the decisions, the decisions that you make, the foods that you put in your body and um, your fiber increase your fiber intake is likely increased. Nitric oxide intake is likely increased through leafy greens and uh, beets and things like that. And so uh, that's the great thing. That's what we really enjoy talking about is that the diet that helps out uh, athletes, a plant-based diet that helps out athletes and helps them recover, reduce inflammation, increase their energy, uh, improve their performance. It also helps with longevity. And you, all you have to do is look at the, some of the athletes we've mentioned, the Scott Jurek's, the, the Fiona Oaks is the, the rich rolls, Rip Esselstyn's they're, you know, they're all in their fifties and, uh, and they're rocking too. Yeah. What's that? And they're crushing it. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And John Joseph is almost 60 and, and he's doing an Ironman he's triathlon a yeah. <laughs> this month. And Rip Esselstyn set a world record at, he must've been like 58 years old or something when he set that record in the 200 meter backstroke. So like, that's the thing that the longevity is there. It's, it's mm -hmm. so cool. And, uh, and that comes from this, this plant-based diet that, that benefits athletes too. Yeah. And I, I kind of want to dive into that because again, I've been listening to, to the audible for the book and you guys mentioned a lot of what the athletes are, are eating and how they're fueling the body, which is very different from like what you would read from like the muscle mags and like back in the day when you're trying to right. build muscle. Um, there's a lot of people that listen to the podcast that, um, are already vegan. Um, and a, a nice chunk of them are veg curious, right? They're wanting to transition and the whole concept of like fit vegan is we include fitness within the aspect of veganism. So what I want to ask you is from like having these conversations from all these people and from your own personal experience, a lot of people that are transitioning are scared to, um, that their performance is going to be affected, um, that they're going to lose, they're going to lose their gains. Um, that they're going to feel weak. Um, so how, what have you found in your own experience and from talking to all these like top level athletes um, who keep up their performance, who like are still crushing, yeah. like what have you found the difference? What would you have to say to those people that are like, ah, I'm scared that like if I transition, I'll lose muscle, my performance is going to be affected. Well, first, luckily, I, I would first acknowledge that and honor that, that that does happen for some people. And, and it makes sense. So if you, if you go from an omnivorous diet of consuming, let's say 3000 calories per day, but for whatever reason, animal rights, the environment, you got a new pet, your, your, your partner inspired you, 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 you read the plant-based athlete, you saw the game changers. Yeah. You follow lucky on Instagram, whatever it is, you, you got inspired to adopt a plant-based diet and you took out all the meat, took out the dairy, took out the eggs, took out, you know, other animal byproducts that were in certain foods and replaced them with uh, leafy greens and fruits, salads, things like that. And now this 3000 calorie omnivorous diet is now down to like 2000 calories of plant-based food. And people wonder, where did my strength go? Where did my energy go? Where, where did my weight go? You cut out a third of your calorie intake, a third of it. And you're wondering like, oh, this, this diet didn't work for me. You know, this, I tried the plant-based diet, it didn't work for me. So I, I, I respect that because I've, I've, I've heard that on tour for 20 years. You know, I, I've been speaking for almost 20 years, it seems like on tour. And I've had so many people say that to me, whether they're bodybuilders or football players, or especially it's, it's mostly men and it's mostly strength athletes who say, you know, I tried a vegan diet and it just didn't work for me. And if you look at historical context of plant-based athletes, like Tony Gonzalez, we mentioned him in the book briefly, we had a much longer story about him. It just didn't make it into the book, but he was one of our key stories uh, originally in, in one of the early drafts of the book, because He's arguably the greatest tight end in NFL history. So he's, the, I mean, the greatest player in his position in the history of the NFL. And he adopted a plant-based diet. And, and I was interviewed with him back in 2008, I believe. It was a Wall Street Journal newspaper article. So a long time ago. And uh, I didn't end up making it into the newspaper. It was all about him. And it was even titled like the 247 pound vegan 
And it was a big deal back then, 12, 13 years ago, to have Vegan mentioned in a major newspaper with one of the most famous football players in the world. But what happened was Tony adopted a plant-based diet and he dropped 15 pounds immediately. And it wasn't necessarily weight he wanted to lose. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some muscle and fat, of course, it, it just, and it was in the NFL, like every pound matters when you're, you know, crashing into each other and trying to make the extra yard and all of that. Yeah. And it was also a very controversial thing because there's nutritionists and you have these contracts that are worth tens of millions of dollars. And they essentially, and I've heard this from talking to people who were, who were involved in this situation. He was basically not allowed to continue with a plant-based diet. Like they just said, you can't do this anymore. You've already lost 15 pounds. Um, you, you're, you're worth millions of dollars to this organization. Uh, you you got to change your way of eating. And so he unfortunately went back to eating some animal protein. But had he figured out the calorie density scale, the nutrient density scale, that wouldn't have happened. Like David Carter is an example. I, I interviewed him for the book. He's an, also an NFL, a former NFL football player. He's a big dude. Yes. Yeah. I've been on tour with him. Very nice guy. We've toured around, you know, different cities together. And uh, he, he was known as the 300 pound vegan, but similar story. He went vegan while in the NFL and dropped 40 pounds. Cause he was, you know, real big guy. He was 300 and something pounds. He dropped 40 pounds right away. And then he, I mean, yes, he got faster. Yes. He got stronger. He got leaner. He got fitter, but he also needed to put the weight back on. So then he worked with some friends of mine, actually. Um, Danny and Giacomo Marchese uh, from veganproteins.com way back again, this is like, you know, almost 10 years ago, probably that helped to get him on a like 10,000 calorie plant-based meal plan for a guy of his size to continue to perform at that level. And then he put the weight back on, on a vegan diet. Yeah. But these are important examples because lucky it happens all the time. People say, so your friends or your, your followers, your contacts, it's a, it is a legitimate concern for some people. And so we have to take it honestly. We can't just say, oh yeah, you know, just eat whole food, plant-based. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Um, not so fast. That's what I say. Not so fast. When you're talking about athletes um, and I've experienced this myself as well. I've gone through injuries. I've gone through setbacks. Even once I was 195 pounds, I dropped down to 165, only go back up to 215 and then eventually over 220. It's, it, we, we adapt based on the environment we put ourselves in. And if you eat in a calorie surplus or a calorie deficit, you, you become the results of those patterns. You know, if you're like, even right now, I'm in a calorie deficit because I'm, 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 I'm stressed. I, yeah. you know, I'm working like crazy. I have one of the most popular books in the world that carries a tr tremendous amount of weight on my shoulders. I'm not going to the gym much right now, which I know is ironic because I wrote a book about being a plant-based athlete, but, but I'm also a retired athlete. I don't, you know, I train for the fun of it these days. Um, there, there's, there's nothing that says I have to go every single day or anything like that. And, and the byproduct is that I've lost like 13 pounds in the last month and a half because of that environment. Um, but I also, leading up to the book launch, I put on like 10 pounds and became 223 pounds, the biggest, strongest I'd ever been in my life because I was gearing up for this book launch and and I and my and my habits created that lifestyle that pattern that would produce those results so the biggest takeaway is that uh lucky people have got to understand the calorie density of food and nutrient density and we cover that in detail in our book and then from there that's how you can prevent that issue of hey I lost all this you know I lost this performance or these gains or I lost weight or I lost muscle it doesn't have to be that way. It absolutely mm -hmm. doesn't have to be that way. In fact, I mean, you, you, you've you seen so much of the book already. Uh, 60 different athletes we interviewed, uh, th over 30 of them tell their story in detail in the book. Other ones provide quotes. They all saw athletic performance benefits from a plant-based diet. Um, even if for some of them, they did lose some weight at first. They figured it out. They were able to right the ship and get back on there and bec become their personal best. And that's and that's what I like so much about this plant-based diet, like how, it, how versatile it is and how once you can figure it out, you can achieve whatever you want in health and fitness. Yeah. And that's, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think it needed a lot of clarification because I, I encountered that often where it's just like, you, you're not eating enough, right? It's obviously going to make a big difference in terms of, yeah. of your energy. And um, I don't want to keep you for too long, but I do want to last you, uh, ask you one last question. Um, sure, sure because you're coming from the strength and, and muscle building um, side of fitness and Matt's coming from the endurance side. Yep. 
Yep. Um, I've had a question that from uh, on my Instagram from the poll I posted today. Um, what would be the difference in terms of, of uh, I want to say macronutrient structure of your way of eating compared to Matt's way of eating? So strength versus mm -hmm. versus endurance. Guess a question that comes up very often. Yeah, you you know the fascinating thing, and I think Matt and I both discovered this to be something maybe we didn't expect is that it's actually pretty similar. It's actually yeah. similar. It, it's, it's a very high carbohydrate for, it, it, for both of us. It's around 70% of our total calories from carbohydrates. And look, you have to know that I haven't used any sports supplements in nine years, almost 10 years since 2012, no protein powders, nothing but vitamin B12 and the occasional vitamin D uh, or uh, DHA EPA. And, uh, and I've been the biggest and strongest I've been in my life and in some really good shape at, at certain times too, even in my forties, um, with, a, with this modest protein intake. So I've been consuming about 70% of calories from, uh, from carbohydrates, about 10% from protein and 20% from fat. And, and Matt's about the same. And, and so are many other endurance athletes about 70, it's either 70, 15, 15, like I wrote about in shred it or mm. 70, 10, 20. And even as I, I can tell you right now, I mean, I, I, I have it, I documented in, in my notebooks, you know, um, and even just recently for this book launch, I documented everything that I ate for, you know, for days on end for a week at a time, for another week at a time, another week at a time from, you know, February and April and May at different times of the year. And I really do even weighing anywhere from on a, on a given time period, 205 to 220 pounds over the last five years mm -hmm. that I've been over 200 pounds. I eat just 10% uh, of my calories from protein. Like it, that just shows up in the data. When I record it, it's like, that's, I mean, cause I eat things like burrito bowls. You think, oh, wow, you, well, you got all these beans and everything. Yeah, but the beans are mostly carbohydrate. And so are the rice. So is the rice. So are the leafy greens. Uh, so are the vegetables, you know, so are the tomatoes and all this other stuff. And so that's what we found to be actually pretty interesting was that whether you're a strength athlete, a power athlete, a bodybuilder, a runner, a team, you know, a team sport athlete, like basketball player or a baseball player, football player, it's, it's really, it's really kind of the same. What, what the difference is, is what your calorie intake versus expenditure is like. So like, yeah. for example, we have, uh, we have Megan Duhamel in the book, Olympic gold medal winning figure skater. She's like four foot 11 and hundred pounds. And then we have Nick Squires, who's, uh, you know, uh, California state powerlifting record holder who deadlifts more than 600 pounds off the ground. And he weighs like 230 pounds. So he's two and a half times, you know, or not two and a half, but he's more than twice the size of Megan Duhamel. They're going to eat differently. Yeah. Um, those are their calories. They might, but they, they both may still eat, you know, high, high carbohydrate intake, but Nick's going to have way more calories than, uh, than Megan because of what his requirements are. So that's kind of the fascinating thing that we realized is that, you know, a lot of athletes eat, uh, you know, the kind of the same macronutrient breakdown. It's just that they eat based on what their actual calorie needs are, whether you're an Ironman triathlete burning calories like crazy or uh, a, an athlete that just doesn't burn quite as many for that particular sport, like a golfer, for example. And so yeah. it's, it's really based on, on the individual and, uh, and based on what you're actually doing. Yeah, I love hearing that. I, I was kind of expecting that that answer that it would be very similar. Because I don't, if you keep the protein the same from like what we talked about, it doesn't really need to be a change, a major shift in the rest of your macronutrients. Um, but Robert, I I know uh, you know our, our time is up together, but I we're gonna do an IG live. Um, yeah. So the week that this podcast is coming out for you guys listening, I have, we have a cool giveaway for you. The week that this podcast is going live. I'm going to be doing a live with Robert and we'll be giving away five books for the plant-based athlete. But the only way to win a book is you have to jump on the live and we're going to pick the five winners on the live. All right. So stay tuned on my Instagram. I'll be sharing all the information when this podcast goes live. You guys have a chance to win the book. Absolutely incredible. Again, I just listened to the audio, the audible. I'm almost done. I'm excited. I can't wait to get the physical copy so I can add it to my library. <laughs> Take some nice pictures. Um, yeah. But Robert, thank you very much for jumping on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Guys, I will link all the link down below if you guys want to purchase the book. Um, Audible, Amazon, I'm pretty sure it's available. Like, I'll put all the links down there. Robert's yeah. Instagram, veganbodybuilding.com. 
everything will be down in the um, description box for, for the podcast. So Robert, thank you for jumping on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Lucky. I appreciate you having me on. And uh, it's an honor to talk with you today and, and hope to uh, cross paths again in person one of these days whenever we get back out there on tour. Yes, definitely.